Okay, how's my favorite Monday morning calculus class? Can you guys hear me in the back? Am I amplified? Awesome. I'm going to try and close this door. Hold on. Are we close? Okay, never mind. So did you guys have a good weekend? Opening weekend for baseball. That was exciting. Nice April weather. Finally getting a little bit spring-like. If you guys not like the monologue, do, should we just start with the math? OK. As a reminder, you have a quiz, not this week, but next week. Uh, on sections 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5. So do not ask me uh, what's on the quiz this week. There is no quiz this week. The next quiz will be two weeks after that on sections 20, uh, 4.1 through 4.4. 4.1 is what we're doing today. And just to uh, put on this on your horizon, the final exam is May 12th. Is that really a Monday? That doesn't sound right. Uh, it's a Thursday, yeah. Because Cinco de Mayo is a Wednesday. No, no, wait, that should be. No, Cinco de Mayo is a Thursday. OK. Anyway, May 12th, whatever day that is, that's the day you show up for your final, which is at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. High 2. OK. So we're going to talk today about maximum and minimum values. Are you? OK, well, this is something we can verify. Let's pull up the old uh, website here. May 12th. It says Friday. That doesn't seem right. But it is definitely May 12th. <laughs> OK. Good thing it's not a math class, right? <laughs> All right, so once again, we're going to do section 4.1, which is the uh, maximum and minimum values. In case you're interested, registration is coming up. Uh, I am teaching Calc 2 in the fall. You can use that information to register for Calc 2, or you can use that information to avoid registering for Calc 2, depending on your uh, preferences. OK, so we have progressed from chapter 3 into chapter 4. Chapter 3 was more about finding derivatives of various functions, the so-called transcendental functions, especially exponentials and logarithms and mean inverse trigonometric functions. Uh, today, it will start chapter four, in which we talk a lot about applications of the derivative, the different things we can do with derivatives. Okay? And finding extreme values of functions is one important goal of the course. You may remember I put this up on the screen on the first day. I do have a dot here. Yes, OK. And we talked about how the angle of the leaf pattern uh, of veins is the uh, angle which minimizes the total amount of water pressure in the leaf. And we can figure out this minimum angle using calculus. Now, does the leaf do a calculus problem in order to decide how to grow its veins? No, it doesn't. But what that means is that we can use calculus to describe not only the rational world that we can control, but the natural wor world, which is somehow controlled by certain optimizing principles. So lots of times, we have a system that we control, and we'd like to find uh, extreme values of certain functions. For instance, if we are uh, running some company, obviously we want to maximize our profits. Or if we're building something, we would want to minimize the cost of building that thing. So lots of times, we have a design choice to make, 
and we would choose it in such a way to optimize our uh, certain outputs. For instance, here is a picture of a soup can. And all soup cans hold the same amount of soup. They're basically about 12 ounces. Uh, but you could design lots of different soup cans that would all hold 12 ounces. You could have something that's you know, short and wide, like a tuna fish can. Or you could have something that's tall and thin, like a jar of olives or something. Now, why is a soup can designed like this? If you, it turns out that if you set up the function, which uh, indicates the amount of metal used to make a can, then of all the cans which hold 12 ounces of soup, this is pretty close to the shape which minimizes the total amount of metal. So why do you care about minimizing metal? Well, because you have to pay for metal to build these cans. So the cheapest can holding 12 ounces is basically this shape, which is kind of cool. It's a nice little calculus problem. Now, other times, like with the leaf, there are laws of nature or laws of science which come from certain minimizing principles. Here is a picture of a glass mug of coffee. And you see that there's uh, sunlight shining on the mug. And on the shadow that the mug makes on the table, you see lots of uh, beams of light that are shining through the coffee. Okay? Now when the light comes into the uh, glass and through the coffee, it actually changes its angle. It bends a little bit. And the way that it bends depends on the speed of light in the coffee compared to the speed of light in the air. Okay, the speed of light is slightly slower in the coffee than it is in, in pure air. And so that beam of light is going to bend. How it actually bends depends on the ratio of the basically the viscosity of this coffee compared to the viscosity of air. Okay, So that's another calculus problem by which you can find the equations for these beams of light. So it's all based on something that was uh, vocalized by this guy, Pierre-Louis Montpetit, uh, that action is minimized through the wisdom of God. So he was talking about action of, of motion in some system. Uh, but in many cases, lots of things are either maximized or, in this case, minimized. So this is Montpetit dressed for his expedition to Lapland. So that's not his real hair. That's just a big fur hat. OK. so. All of these are based on an important fact about functions uh, and extreme values. What do we mean by an extreme value? Well, to set this up, let's start with a function. Function's got to have a domain. Call it domain D, just for reference. The absolute maximum of the function is at a point C if f of C is greater than or equal to f of x for any other x in the domain. So if you had to formulate a definition of absolute maximum of a function, that would probably be how you do it. It's the, it's the point at which the function's value is larger, or at least as large, as any other function value over the domain. Okay. Now, if you want to define absolute minimum, that's easy. You just take the inequality and you reverse the order. So instead of greater than or equal to, you're going to say that f of c is less than or equal to f of x, again, over all x in the domain. That number, that output f of c, that's called the maximum value of the function over the domain d. And if you're doing minimums, then you call it the minimum value. So we try to keep these things distinct. The point at which the function achieves its maximum and the maximum that comes out of the function. So the first point, the thing that we plug in to make the function achieve its maximum value, that's called the maximum or sometimes maximum point. That number that comes out of the function, which is larger than all the other numbers, that is the maximum value. All right? So values, when we say value of a function, we're talking about a y, something that comes out of the function. When we say point, we mean something you plug into the function. That would be an x. OK. Now, because maxima and minima and maximum values and minimum values are pretty much doing the same thing, you know, if one person's maximum is another person's minimum, then we might treat them simultaneously. And so we'll use the word extremum. An extremum means either a maximum or a minimum. An extreme value means either a maximum value or a minimum value. Yes? No extreme value is the output. Extremum would be the input. Mm -hmm. okay, with the value means output. And without the word value, you can usually take it to mean input. 
OK. So here's an important theorem which says basically that functions do have extreme values. It's called, creatively I suppose, the extreme value theorem. Let f be a function which is continuous on the closed interval a to b. Then f attains a maximum value f of c and an absolute minimum value f of d at numbers c and d in the interval a to b. So here's a sample function, right? I've graphed it here. Uh, it's got uh, point A, point B, the domain of the function is the closed interval A to B, and it has a maximum value, f of C, and an absolute minimum value, f of D. Okay. So the maximum value occurs at the right-hand endpoint, and so the right-hand endpoint of the domain here is the maximum point. So B is equal to C in this diagram. Where's the absolute minimum? Looks like it's right around there. Okay. So D is the minimum, and the minimum value is this Y value F of D. Okay. So all we're saying is that funct continuous functions on closed bounded intervals A to B, they do achieve a maximum value and a minimum value. Make sense? OK, well, who cares? This seems kind of obvious, right? Uh, to actually prove this theorem is very, very difficult, and it's beyond the stuff that I would want to show you in a Calculus 1 course. If you want to see a proof of the extreme value theorem, then you have to take a course we call Analysis 1. Sounds awesome, right? It is awesome. But it's really based on very important facts about real numbers uh, that we don't talk about too much in detail. But I will say that if you try to state this theorem for functions where the domain is not real numbers but just rational numbers, then the theorem is not true anymore. Okay? So it's something about real numbers as opposed to just rational numbers, which makes this true. However, I do want to show you how important all of the hypotheses are so that you can see how important this theorem is. So let's take a look at this function here. f of x is a piecewise defined function. It's x between 0 and 1, and x minus 2 between 1 and 2. So how is this function graphed? Well, it's piecewise defined, so it's a piecewise graphed function. On one interval, it just looks like the uh, graph of y equals x. On the other interval, it looks like the graph of x, uh, y equals x minus 2. OK. Now, if we take a look at the graph here, uh, what would be the best possible answer for the maximum value of this function? What would you like to call the maximum value of this function? 2. OK. And why 2? What are the coordinates of this point here? Yes, you're, but the, the question I ask right now is what, what are the coordinates of this point? 1, 1, and that's not the maximum value because why? Okay, this, this point is actually not in the range of the function. So the function doesn't go all the way up to the value 1. It gets arbitrarily close to the value 1. So in the business, we say that the, the least upper bound of the values of the function is 1. 1 is bigger than all the function values. And 1 is the smallest number, which is bigger than all the function values. But 1 is not the maximum value, because the maximum value has to be a value. It has to be f of something. And 1 is not f of something. Okay? Numbers arbitrarily close to 1 on the bottom of 1 are function values. But 1 itself is not a function value. So this function does not have a maximum value on the closed interval 0 to uh, 2, or on 0 to 1. <coughs> okay. Now, we just said that functions are supposed to achieve their extreme values. But why did this not happen? Well, this function is not continuous. And so as far as the extreme value theorem goes, it doesn't make a difference. Right? The extreme value theorem only applies to functions which are continuous, and that's not continuous. Okay? This is why we need the continuity assumption in order to assume that the function has an extreme value. So that's one example where the extreme value theorem uh, doesn't work because you have not satisfied the hypothesis. Questions about this? OK. Here's another example. Function f of x equals x, and we restrict to the domain 0 to 1, but the interval is closed at 0 and open. Is it closed at 0 and open at 1. Now, this is pretty much the same diagram as the left-hand side of this diagram, and basically the same problem. The function's values get arbitrarily close to 1, but they do not achieve 1. 
One is the least upper bound of the function values, but it's not the maximum of the function values. There is no maximum value of the function on this interval. Now, I thought the problem was that this function wasn't continuous. Is this function continuous? Sure, it's continuous. But the problem now is that we have an open endpoint to our interval. So as the uh, x values get close to that endpoint, their function values get larger, but they don't achieve that least upper bound value. Okay? So it's not con it is continuous, but the domain of the function is not closed. If we were to close up the domain of that function, that is, if we were to include the endpoint 1, then we would fill in this point here. It would suddenly become a value of the function, and that would be the maximum value of the function. Okay? So deleting this endpoint violates the extreme value theorem. Okay. So this is why we need a closed interval in order to uh, assume the things that come from the extreme value theorem. Here's a third example. Consider the function f of x is 1 over x. That's a continuous function, at least where it's defined. Uh, use the domain 1 to infinity. This is actually a closed interval because it includes the endpoint 1, and there isn't any endpoint on the other side to include. It's everything greater than or equal to 1. OK, that's a continuous function. That's a closed interval. What's the minimum value of the function on this interval? What would you like to say the minimum value is? You'd like to say it's 0. Okay, in fact, 0 is the greatest lower bound of all the function values. 0 is less than or equal to all function values. And nothing which is greater than 0 is less than or equal to all the function values. But 0 is not a function value. There's no x for which f of x equals 0. And so 0 cannot be the minimum value. Okay, function values get arbitrarily close to 0, above 0, but it does not achieve the value 0. So what was wrong here? This continuous function on closed interval, the interval has to be bounded. There has to be a closed interval between two finite values, a and b. In those situations, we are guaranteed to have an extreme value. Otherwise, not necessarily true. Okay, so this is why we care about continuous functions on closed, bounded intervals. Questions? Okay, good. Well, having justified the existence of the things we're trying to find, uh, it doesn't actually help us find them. So to actually find extreme values, we have to be a little bit more uh, careful, and we will use something called Fermat's theorem. So to tell you about Fermat's theorem, and this is going to bring in the calculus, I want to change the idea of extreme uh, to not just absolute extreme, but relative extreme. So here's the new definition. A function f has a local maximum, or sometimes called relative maximum. These two terms are, are synonymous. Uh, at c, if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x. Now, when it, we were talking about absolute or global. We would say, for all x in the domain of the function. But here we're saying, for all x near c. Okay. Now, to be a little bit more technical, what we mean is that f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in some open interval containing c. Now, vice versa, you can just uh, change the inequality to the other way, and then you'll be talking about, instead, a local minimum. Okay. So on my diagram here, can you see the local maximum? There's a local maximum right around here, and a local minimum right around here. There's the local maximum. There's the local minimum. Okay. So to, to speak in terms of uh, limiting ideas, uh, a, fun a point is a local maximum if when you zoom in on the graph and you see only what's going on on the graph near that point, it looks like a global maximum. If I block out everything except for some square around this point, then I'm going to see something that looks like a maximum. I'm not going to see this point up here. I'll just see everything around that point that's going to be a local maximum. Okay, same thing here on the, around the local minimum. If I zoom in, I'm going to see something which looks just like the global minimum value of a function. To put this in personal terms, uh, when I was in high school, I was quite a cocky guy, and I would, because I was the smartest person I knew. Right? I looked around, smartest person in town, I must be pretty smart. Right? Went to college and discovered 
I was not even the smartest person in college, let alone the smartest person in the world. So I was a local maximum. Then when I got to college, I realized that I was not the global maximum. Maybe that's happened to you. Not as a result of anything happening here, I hope. No, it was calculus that humbled me, that's for sure. Now, what's the difference between a local maximum, or a local maximum value, and a global maximum, or a global maximum value? Well, local extrema can be global extrema. For instance, this point here is a local minimum, and it's also the global minimum. Right? Nearby, there aren't any larger function values. Or I should say, aren't any function values less than this value. And that's what makes it local. But also, if you look at all the function values, there aren't any which are less than or equal to this value. So it is also global. A local extreme can be a global extreme. But it's not necessarily true that local extrema are global extrema, because here's a point which is locally the biggest around, and it's not globally the biggest. Okay? This is me in high school. I thought I was the smartest guy around. I was really just the smartest guy in Evansville, Indiana. And then when I got to college, I realized I was not up here. I was just down here. I was a local maximum. So globals could be locals. Locals could be globals, but aren't necessarily. And global maxima need not be a local maximum. Because to be a local maximum, we would need to surround this top point here with an open interval. We need to draw an open interval around that point, And we can't because it's on the end point. Okay, so this is an important distinction. Global extremes, which are on the end points of the domain, are not local extremes. B is, a, is the global maximum just by inspection. But it's not a local maximum. This is a, um, that's a distinction I want to make, and you're probably going to ask me that a couple more times in the semester. I'll answer it as many times as you need. A global extreme is not necessarily a local extreme, and it can't be if it's at the end point. Okay? But you could say that if it's a global maximum value, it's either a local or an end point. I should say, here's a local max, and here's the end point. Okay. So, an important tool from calculus for finding these uh, ex local extreme values is known as Fermat's theorem. Uh, it makes sense that calculus can only be used to find local extremes, because calculus is based on limits. And limits are based on what's going on near a point. Once you start zooming in on a point to try to find a derivative, then you're forgetting everything which is going on away from that point. So Fermat's theorem says, suppose f has a local extremum at a point, then the derivative of the function and is differentiable at that point, then the derivative has to be 0. So as an example, here's our function. We've got a local maximum and a local minimum. And at both of these points, we see a horizontal tangent line, which means a derivative of 0. Okay. So that, that's Fermat's theorem. Now, why would such a theorem be true? I mean, you can just look at it, but how could you demonstrate it in a little bit more detail? Think about what uh, a tangent line is. It's a limit of secant lines. And think about all the secant lines which go through this local maximum point right here. Well, if you take points on the right-hand side of the local maximum, then those secant lines are going to be going downward. So they have negative slopes. On the left-hand side, though, those secant lines are going to be going upward, so they will have positive slopes. Now, the tangent line is a limit of secant lines. And if the secant lines have a positive slope on one side and a negative slope on the other, how can a, a thing be a limit of both positive things and negative things? Well, what's in between positives and negatives? Zero. Okay? To say that the, if the secant lines are negative on the right, then the limit has to be not necessarily negative, but at least non-positive. If the slopes are positively, uh, positive on the left, then the limit of the slopes is non-negative. So what's non-negative and non-positive? Zero. OK. So to do it in symbols now, let's suppose that we have a local maximum at a point C. If x is a little bit more than C, then because C is a local maximum, f of C is smaller, uh, f, of, f of x is less than f of C, or I should say less than or equal to. So what that means is that the difference f of x minus f of c 
is less than or equal to 0, because that numerator is less than or equal to 0. So if all the difference quotients for x slightly bigger than c are non-negative, then the limit of all the difference quotients over x slightly bigger than c is non-negative. That is, the limit from the right of the difference quotient is non-negative. Now, on the other side, now think about x being slightly less than c. f of x will still be less than or equal to f of c because c is local maximum. So that numerator is non-positive, less than or equal to 0. On the other hand, the denominator now is going to be negative because x is less than c. Okay, so this difference quotient will be slightly greater than 0. And so the limit will also be greater than or equal to 0. If this function is differentiable, then the limit from the left of the difference quotients equals the limit from the right of the difference quotients. That limit must be less than or equal to 0 and greater than or equal to 0. The only way that can happen is if the limit is exactly 0. Okay, so, so that is Fermat's theorem. Now, any questions about Fermat's theorem? Okay, seems pretty cool, right? Uh, interesting point about the fact about Fermat is that uh, he didn't like calculus that much. He was around from 1601 to 1665, and so just around when he died was when calculus was becoming really popular. Newton and Leibniz were coming out with their uh, ideas, or at least, actually, around that time they were still only formulating them. But the really cool stuff about Fermat uh, can be summarized in a couple of stories. So Fermat was a, was a lawyer, and he was an amateur number theorist. So he liked to do a little math on the side. And he had a famous correspondent named Blaise Pascal. How many of you heard of Pascal? Pascal's triangle, right? That Pascal. Pascal quit math to become a monk. But we're not talking about Pascal. We're talking about Fermat. So Fermat would come up with these number theory problems. And he would you know, be reading some book about number theory. And then he would pose an interesting problem. And then he would spend like a month of his free time trying to solve that problem. And when he finally got the solution, he would write a letter to his friend Pascal. Dear Blaze, how are you? I was thinking about this math problem the other day. I wonder if you can solve it. So he would write down the math problem that he had spent a month solving. One week later, he would write another letter to Pascal saying, Dear Blaze, what's up, dog? I was just thinking about that problem that I wrote you a week ago, and now I know how to solve it. So what happened there? Right? He spent a month solving a problem, and then he wrote a letter to Pascal making it look like he spent a week solving the problem. So Pascal thought, oh, this guy from is pretty smart. So Fermat was doing this a lot. He was reading number theory books and writing down solutions to equations. And he was uh, taking notes in the books that he was reading. Uh, he was reading a book by Diophantus about Diophantine equations, which are certain equations with integer solutions. And he came up with this, or he started talking about this theorem. Uh, we know that there are lots of integers, x, y, and z, which satisfy the equation x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Right? You know this is Pythagoras' theorem if x, y, and z are the sides of a right triangle. So for instance, 3, 4, and 5, 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, and together you get 25, which is 5 squared. And there are lots and lots, in fact, infinitely many solutions to x squared plus y squared equals z squared, which are all integers which is kind of interesting. So Diophantus knew that there were no solutions to x cubed plus y cubed plus z cubed, or equals z cubed, if x and y and z are integers. So there's no like integer right triangle in three dimensions, okay? Which is kind of interesting too, that you can do this in the plane, but you cannot do this in three dimensional space. Now what Fermat said, well, he had a nice proof, which showed that there's no solution to x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth when x and y and z are all positive whole numbers. So there's no four-dimensional right triangle with integer sides. And then he wrote something which said, in fact, this is not true for any n bigger than 2 than there, that there are integers x, y, and z for which x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. Okay. Then he wrote one of the most famous sentences in mathematics. I have a clever proof of this fact, which the margin is too small to contain. So he was taking notes in the book, and he had this awesome theorem, and he wrote down the statement of the theorem, but he did not write down the proof of the theorem. And then he died. 
That's not funny. He died. But he didn't die right after this. He, he died some later time. And his descendants were going through his estate, and they found all his math notes, and he thought, oh, this is pretty cool. Uh, but they didn't understand anything about it, so they shipped him off to the mathematicians. And the mathematicians looked at all of his theorems and all of his proofs, and they you know, dotted the I's and crossed the T's and fixed a few things. But this was one thing that they couldn't figure out. They couldn't figure out the proof that Fermat had conceived to this problem that there's no solution to x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. OK, so now you guys understand this theorem, right? At least you understand the statement. You all know what x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n means. And if you played around with it a little bit, you might actually start to try to prove a theorem like this. It's, it's tantalizingly simple to state. However, it's proven to be very, very difficult to prove. The giants of mathematics from Gauss and Euler, all those guys, could not come up with proofs from Fermat's last theorem. Uh, universities used to hold contests to come up with proofs of Fermat's last theorem. And people would send in all these proofs. And there was a form letter that went back said, thank you for submitting your proof of Fermat's last theorem. Your first mistake is on page mm, line mm. So they could just fill it in and say, sorry, no dice. Now, it wasn't until the middle of the, say, 1940, I think, that there was some growing evidence that Fermat's last theorem might actually be true. Mathematicians thought, well, this is so hard to prove that it's probably not true. There's probably some really, really large n and some really, really large x and y and z, which just coincidentally satisfy this equation. But it turns out that it became equivalent to a certain conjecture about uh, elliptic curves. This is an example of an elliptic curve. And modular forms. This is an example of a modular form, whatever they are, right? That's a curve. That's a form. So something called the taniyama shimura Vey conjecture related elliptic curves and modular forms. You guys know Taniyama, Shimura, and Vey, right? Well, it turns out that uh, to the, there's a correspondence between modular forms and elliptic curves and elliptic curves and modular forms. Or so everyone believed. This was the conjecture. Everyone believed the conjecture. But what was radical was that it was proven equivalent to Fermat's last theorem. Okay. If there was an elliptic curve which didn't have a modular form connected to it, it would be a counterexample to this theorem. It would be an x, y, and z, and an n which satisfy this equation. Okay. Now, fast forward from 40s, I guess, up through 1994, where a certain professor was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago. And the summertime, we were preparing for our math camp. And the instructor burst in with the amazing fact that someone had proven the Taniyama Shimura Vey conjecture. His name was um, Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles spent a decade in his attic working only by himself, diligently trying to prove the Taniyama Shimura Vey conjecture. And in a series of lectures at Oxford, over three days, he unveiled his proof. And when he finished his proof, he put down the chalk and said, I think I'll stop there. No, before he did that, he wrote corollary for Ma's last theorem. Then he put down the chalk. Bedlam. The entire mathematics world erupted. At U of C, we were turning over cars in the streets. There were mobs, demonstrations. Everyone was really excited until a few holes were found in this theorem, uh, actually very large holes. And it wasn't finally sewn up until 1998, about four or five years later, why I got another guy, Richard Taylor. So Taylor and Wiles finally put together all of the uh, facts about Fermat's last theorem. So here we have a theorem which was stated by someone in the 17th century and not proven until the end of the 20th century. So easy to state, yet so exceedingly difficult to prove. And there's more to this story. Uh, if you ever read M Marilyn Bossavant in the Parade magazine, she started. She published a book saying that the proof was false because she couldn't understand it. And the mathematical community responded, well, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's not true. And so now this is widely accepted. And Taylor and Wiles were presented with uh, a prize of $1 million for solving this famous unsolved problem. So there you go. There is money in math. OK, so what does that have to do with calculus? Nothing really, but you know, everyone should hear the story of Fermat's last theorem. Don't you agree? OK. So end of tangent, back on the story of extreme values. And what we were going over was this idea about Fermat's last theorem, not last theorem, Fermat's theorem, which says that at a local extreme uh, point, if the function is differentiable, the derivative must be 0. OK, so back to our scheduled class. We can use Fermat's theorem to find 
the extreme points. And that's the whole idea. Extreme value theorem tells me that there are extreme points, but it doesn't tell me where they are. One thing I do know is that if I have a function which is continuous and its domain is a closed bounded interval a to b, then there is a global maximum point somewhere. And what I've said is that that global maximum is either on the endpoints or it's not. Right? If it's on the endpoints, well, there are only two endpoints. If your global maximum is an endpoint, then it's either A or it's B. Okay? That makes sense, right? If it's not an endpoint, then it's inside the open interval A to B. And what that means is that it's also a local maximum. Because at a local maximum, you have to be able to get an open interval around that maximum. And that can happen only if the point is inside the domain. So if it's a local max, then either it's differentiable at that point, or it's not. If it is differentiable at that point, I have a local maximum at a point where the function is differentiable. And Fermat says the derivative has to be 0. If the function is not differentiable at that point, well, it's not differentiable. Uh, but that's probably a, a, a condition I can solve for as well. So no matter where the global maximum point C is, it has to end up in one of these buckets. It's either an endpoint, that is either A or B, or it's a point where the derivative is 0, or it's a point where there is no derivative at that point. Okay? So from the whole infinite number of points in the closed interval A to B, we have narrowed it down to the endpoints and what we call the critical points where the derivative is 0 or there is no derivative. Now that's usually a much smaller set, often a finite number of points. All we have to do is compare the function values at that point, at those points, and we'll find the maximum. Okay? So to summarize the method now in words, this is called the closed interval method for finding the extreme values of a function on a closed bounded domain, A to B. We have to check the function by evaluating at the endpoints, A and B. We also have to find the critical points. Those are the points where the derivative is 0 or there is no derivative. And we have to evaluate F at those critical points. Now we just have to find the biggest one. So the point which has the largest function value, that's the maximum points, and the value is the maximum value. The point where the uh, smallest or most negative function value, that's the minimum. And the value that comes out is the minimum value. Now, that seems pretty straightforward. To find the extreme values of a function defined on the closed bounded interval, find the endpoints, find the critical points, plug them in, pick the largest. That's all you got to do. Does that make sense? Would you like to see this in action? Sure. Let's do one of these. OK. We'll do many of these. Find the extreme values of the function f of x equals 2x minus 5 on the interval minus 1 to 2. OK, so what do we have to do? We have to uh, evaluate f at the endpoints and at the critical points. What are the critical points of this function f of x equals 2x minus 5? Well, there are places where the derivative is either 0 or there is no derivative. What's the derivative here? The derivative is 2. So when is the derivative 0? Not 0. When is it undefined? It's always defined. It's always 2. So where are the critical points? There are no critical points. And we only need to look at the endpoints. We need to evaluate f at the left endpoint, negative 1, and the right endpoint, positive 2. 2 times negative 1 minus 5 is negative 7. 2 times 2 minus 5 is negative 1. OK, so where's the maximum value? Maximum value is negative 1. And the minimum value is negative 7. The maximum point is the number that we plug in to get the maximum value, which would be 2. And the minimum point would be the number that we plug in to get the minimum value. That would be negative 1. Okay? So the absolute minimum point is negative 1. The absolute minimum value is negative 7. The absolute maximum point is 2. And the absolute maximum value is negative 1. Questions about that one? I mean, it's kind of boring, right? Because the function is just going up in this upward right uh, direction. So of course, the minimum value is going to be at the left-hand endpoint, and the maximum value is going to be at the right-hand endpoint. But it's due to the fact that there aren't any critical points 
inside the interval. You only look at the endpoint. OK, well, that was too easy, I guess. We should try something harder, like the, find the extreme values of f of x equals x squared minus 1 on the same interval, negative 1 to 2. OK, so what do we have to do here? We have to find the um, critical points, find the places where the derivative is 0, or there is no derivative. Well, what's the derivative of f of x? 2x, OK? And for which x is 2x equal to 0? Only when x equals 0. So there is one critical point when x equals 0. That means we have to evaluate the function at our two endpoints, negative 1 and 2, and our critical point, 0. OK? Well, now this is just a simple plug and chug. Uh, when x is negative 1, f of x is 0. When x is 0, f of x is negative 1. And when f is 2, I'm sorry, when x is 2, uh, we have x squared minus 1 is 2 squared minus 1 is 3. OK, so which of these is the largest? 3 is the largest, so that's the maximum value. Negative 1 is the most negative, right? So it's the minimum. And so the Maximum value is 3, the maximum point is 2, the minimum value is 0, um, minimum value is negative 1, and the minimum point is 0. Okay. And what's this point here? Well, it's nothing. Right? It's an endpoint, and it's not the largest, and it's not the most negative, so it's neither the global maximum nor the global minimum. Can't be a local anything because it's an endpoint, and so it's just, it's just an endpoint. Not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just not extreme. Okay. All right. I take by your silence that you're okay with this. All right, well, let's kick it up a notch. Find the extreme values of this function 2x cubed minus 3x squared plus 1 on the interval, oh, same interval, negative 1 to 2. Okay, so remind me what we're looking for. Where, what, sh what point should we find? Points where the derivative is 0, those are called critical points. So the derivative, we can just take it, is uh, 6x squared minus 6x. And if you factor that, it becomes 6x times x minus 1. So if the derivative, f prime of x, is 0, then 6x times x minus 1 is 0. And the only way that can happen is when x is 0, or when x minus 1 is 0, the two critical points then are at 0 and 1. Any other critical points? Well, there's no places where the derivative is not defined. So the only places where there are critical points are when x is 0 and x is 1. Negative 1 and negative and 2 are not critical points. They are endpoints. We need to check all four of those then. Negative 1, 0, positive 1, and 2. Okay. So now this is just, uh, we have to evaluate. f of negative 1, I did all the algebra for you here, which is nice of me. 2 minus, uh, sorry, negative 2 minus 3 plus 1 is negative 4. What's f of 0? It's always easy to find f of 0 because you just look at the constant term of a polynomial. So f of 0 is 1. It's not too hard to find f of 1 quickly either because you can just add up the coefficients. 2 minus 3 plus 1, f of 1 is 0. And f of 2, oh my god, what's 2 cubed? It's 8. 2 times 8 is 16. 16 minus 3 times 4 is 12, so f of 2 is 5. Do we have to know that on a test? Yes, you have to know 2 cubed is 8 on a test. OK, now which one of these is the largest? Which function value is the largest? f of 2 is the largest function value. So 5 is the maximum value, and 2 is the maximum point. Negative 4 is the most negative of these values. It's the only negative one, right? So that's the absolute or global minimum. And 5 is the absolute or global maximum value. Negative 1 would be the global minimum point, and 2 would be the global maximum
So f of 0 and f of 1 are locals? Yes, that's true. Uh, because this is an extreme uh, value. It's a local extreme value. And you can tell because it's the larger of these two. So basically, what's the function going to do? You, you can't tell without graphing, but we can tell based on the absolute and local extremes. Between negative 4 and 1, there aren't any other extreme values, because otherwise we would have found them. So it, from negative 4, it has to go straight up to 1. And then from 1, it goes straight down to 0. There aren't any other extreme points between 1 and 0 here. So that tells you that 1 is a local maximum. Do I have that label? Yes. 1 is a local maximum. And 0, being lower than the two maxes on its uh, edges, is a local minimum. So we go from global, max, global min to local max to local min to global max. I think this is actually the function that I was graphing when I was stating all these theorems. OK, questions about that one? Yes? That's right. If there was, so how do we know that uh, there's nothing in between, there's no critical points in between negative 1 and 0? Well, the critical points would be either places where the derivative was 0 or places where there was no derivative. And we've already found all of those. Okay. So if there's a, a, a local max or a local min in between these two points, we would have already found it. So there's no local max or local min between these two points, which tells you that from negative, F, from negative 1, 4, it has to go upwards to 0, 1, and doesn't do anything interesting between those two points. Then it goes downwards to 1, 0. Okay? So th that three, those three points and the fact that there aren't any extremes between them tells you that 1 is a local maximum. It has to go from 0, comma, negative, negative 1, comma, negative 4 up to 0, comma, 1, and then down to 1, comma, 0. So local max. Does that make sense? Between uh, 0, comma, 1 and 2, comma, 5, the only critical point is at 1, comma, 0. So that is the local minimum. I'm not graphing it, but because uh, we will be doing graphing later on. This is stuff we can do just by looking at the finite set of critical points and critical values. OK. So here's one for you to try. Find the extreme values of f of x is x to the 2 thirds times x plus 2 on the interval negative 1 to 2. So take a few minutes, talk amongst yourselves, check with your buddies, see if you can find the extreme values of this function. There might be a point where you need to plug something into a calculator. So it would be good if you had a calculator to take it out. Or if you don't, find a buddy with a calculator. So the first thing most of you did was say, I need to take the derivative of this function. So since this function is defined as x to the 2 thirds times x plus 2, I have to use the product rule. However, there's a way to avoid using the product rule, and that's to multiply out x to the 2 thirds times x plus 2. Take x to the 2 thirds times x, and you get x to the 5 thirds. Take x to the 2 thirds times 2, and you get 2x to the 2 thirds. Now, which would you rather differentiate, a, problem, a product of two functions or a sum of two functions? the sum. So which one would you rather do? We'd rather differentiate it like this. Okay, So that's a nice little algebraic choice that you can make to save yourself a little bit of differentiation time. Multiply it out. You get x to the 5 thirds times plus 2x to the 2 thirds. And these are just simple power functions. So the derivative is what you would get using the power rule. 5 thirds x to the 2 thirds plus 2 times 2 thirds, which would be 4 thirds, x to the minus 1 third. OK, and so these are the things which uh, the, the critical points will be the places where this is 0 or where this is not defined. OK, now how would we find those places? Uh, you need to factor this. Uh, it's not a polynomial. It's an algebraic thing. Uh, and you can factor out a third. 
You can factor out x to the minus one third power, and what you get is five times x plus four. Okay. Before you ask me how I did that, confirm with me that this does actually multiply out to this: one third times x to the minus one third times five x is five thirds. X to the minus one third plus this would be three thirds, and so you get two thirds power. Okay. On the other hand, one third times four times x to the minus one third is four thirds x to the minus one third. So you definitely agree that it multiplies out. Now, how do we get that? Well, we took that most negative power and we factored that whole power out. We factored out the entire x to the minus one third. And then what times x to the minus one third equals x to the two thirds? That would be x to the three thirds or x to the one. Now, the nice thing about derivatives is that when you're using the power rule, the derivative, the powers go down by one each time. So if you're factoring out, say, a large negative power, all the other powers will be off by, uh, by a single one or maybe two exponents. So factoring out the negative fractional exponent part leaves just a regular old linear factor left over, which is great because now we can see when this derivative is 0. It's 0 when 5x plus 4 equals 0. So we have a critical point when x is minus 4 fifths, because the derivative is 0. We also have a critical point when x is 0, because then this term is a 0 in the denominator. We won't have a derivative there. So our two critical points are when x is minus 4 fifths and when x is 0. So remember when uh, we're doing all this algebra and people said, do we have to simplify? And I said, we will have to simplify if you need to solve an equation involving the derivative. And this is that time. This is the case where you need to be able to factor an awful expression with fractional exponents like this in order to find a place where it is equal to 0. All right, so now it matters. OK, so two critical points. x is negative 4 fifths. Derivative is 0. x is 0. The derivative is not defined. So add to that the two endpoints, negative 1 and 2. And these are the four points that we have to check. f of negative 1, f of negative 4 fifths, f of 0, and f of 2. OK, now what, what do we evaluate uh, at those points? Oh, yeah, question? We want 5x plus 4 to be 0, so x has to be negative 4 fifths. Now, do we plug these points into the derivative? No, because we already showed that the derivative is going to be 0 or undefined at those points. Right? Th that's where these critical points came from, using the derivative. We're interested in the function values, because we want to know where the function is largest or smallest. So we want f of negative 1. That would be negative 1 to the 5 thirds plus 2 times negative 1 to the 2 thirds. OK, now negative 1 to the 1 third would be the cube root of negative 1. That would be negative 1. So x to the five, negative 1 to the 5 thirds would be negative 1 to the 5th. Negative 1 to the 2 thirds would be negative 1 squared. So it's negative 5 uh, plus 2. And so we get 1. No, not negative 5. Negative 1 plus 2. So we get 1. So f of negative 1 is 1. f of negative 4 fifths, this is probably something you need to calculate for, is 1.4.
goes from net from one up to something very slightly bigger than one, and then down to zero. And so this is a local or relative map. Okay. And the first point, negative one, comma one, that's not. It's not a local anything because it's an endpoint, and it's not a maximum because this is the maximum. It's not a minimum. This is the All right. So questions about that one? A little bit more complicated than the polynomial one.
So as before, we need to find the critical points. The derivative of this function is negative x over the square root of 4 minus x squared. Wait, 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 how did you get that? I like to write the square root of 4 minus x squared as 4 minus x squared to the 1 half power, and the derivative would be 1 half 4 minus x squared to the minus 1 half times the derivative of 4 minus x squared, which would be negative 2x. And that, if you simplify it and write the uh, negative fractional exponent as a radical in the denominator, gives you this here. Okay. And that's 0 when x is 0. Right? It's also not defined when x is plus or minus 2. Now, plus 2 is outside the domain of the function. So we're not interested in that point as a critical point. It's not, it doesn't count. Negative 2, well, we were already checking negative 2 because it was an end point. So the only points we need to check are f negative 2, f of 0, and f of 1. plug in this negative 2 to the derivative? No, because we already used the derivative to get the negative 2 to the critical point. We need to plug it in to the function. We're trying to compare values of the function. So what's f of negative 2? Uh, 4 minus negative 2 squared is 0. The square root of 0 is 0. What's f of 0? f of 0 is 2. f of 1 is the square root of 3. Now, which one's bigger? 2 or the square root of 3? 2 is bigger than the square root of 4. That's bigger than the square root of 3. Okay, so there's your absolute minimum when x equals minus 2. Your absolute maximum is when x equals 0. Y is 2. And then 1 comma the square root of 3 is an end point, but it's not a local max. So it's not an end point. It's not a global max, but a global max. Okay. So there you go. That's the extreme value theorem and the mass theorem. Put them together, you get something called the closed interval method. And get you the extreme values of any function defined Final point, this is why we care so much about showing your work and explaining your answers. You wouldn't want to be the next Fermat, prove the most important theorem in mathematics for 400 years, 